So as you guys know, I've been working with the deaf community for a long time now. Um, it's been more than half my life that I've been with the Singapore deaf community. I started when I was about your age. And uh, today, as, as mentioned, I am involved in sign language research in Singapore. I also do research on um, deaf education needs in Singapore. One of the things that many people ask me about fairly frequently is why am I involved in this community? I don't have deafness in my family, so I don't have deaf relatives. Um, my husband is hearing. He, he knows sign language, which is a great thing for me. Um, I have two kids and they're both hearing. But anyone who has known me since I was in JC would have had to know me with this deaf part of me. It's been so much a part of my life that today to, to actually answer the question why I've been involved with the deaf, um, I have to think really hard and I often tell people I think it's because of Sesame Street. So a long time ago on Sesame Street, they had this deaf character and she used to sign. And I used to watch and I was like, that's such a fascinating language. And I told myself I had to learn it. And many of us in this room, we speak more than one language, right? And when we learn another new language, I think very often it, it may begin really with just that interest in the language alone. But um, as Charlemagne once said, right, if, if you learn another language, you actually possess um, another soul, yeah, a second soul. And it was not possible for me to actually learn sign language without eventually capturing that soul and from whom, from the deaf community themselves. So over the years, I have come to understand more than just the technicalities of the language. Um, so even as I do sign linguistic research, and what we're really trying to do in Singapore is to understand the technical aspects of Singapore Sign Language, what it looks like, um, what the grammatical structure is like, why do we do these things so that we can teach it, teach it to more people, teach it to you with greater level of accuracies. But beyond that, I'm also very interested in the people behind this, in the Singapore deaf community. But before I can explain uh, a bit more about this deaf community that, that I want to talk to you about, let me explain first what language is actually and how a lot of us understand languages. So languages come in two different modes. Today, a lot of linguists recognize that there, there are two modes of languages, right? One would be your oral verbal language, which is something that all of us here would be familiar with, languages that you can hear, languages that you speak, right? But you also have this category of languages which we call visual manual. So earlier this morning, I showed you what a manual language looked like. It's language that's on your hands, language that you can see. The interesting thing, though, is that visual manual languages exist in a realm on their own. They're in no way related to spoken languages. So while you saw me this morning, or like what I'm doing now, I'm signing and I'm speaking at the same time, this is actually not sign language. This is what we call a manually coded language. So I can sign and I can speak. I'm using signs as I speak. But it's not a sign language. Because sign language in itself does, have, uh, does, does not have any uh, requirement for sound. Okay? Uh, and, and people always find it so difficult to understand. No sign language, so you don't like sign English, you don't sign Chinese. Well, you can, but then it would be English, or it would be Mandarin, or any other language that you can sign and speak at the same time. But if you're talking about signed languages in and of themselves, they are developed within communities that have nothing to do with the experience of sound. So deaf people growing up, don't know sound, don't hear language like you do, and therefore do not relate their manner of communication with sound. There is no need for it. Okay? So for example, certain elements of spoken language that you have, like uh, verbs like is, or you know, articles that you use with nouns, er. Uh. So for example, you would say things like, this is a book. And when I say this, I know that I'm referring to a specific book, and there's only one. But for a deaf person, 
you don't need really this, the word this, you don't really need the word er. If this is a book and I point at it, it's clearly a book. I'm pointing at one. This is a computer. It's one. A computer. And that's that. So the deaf world does not orientate itself to sound. And so deaf languages don't have some of these elements that we are familiar with. Okay? Therefore, in the deaf community, when people communicate and when they write, so they go to school just like you and I, right? And they will pick up written language just like you and I. But for them, written language is a second language because sign languages don't have written forms. So they use sign language in daily communication, but when they learn how to read and write, they learn how to read and write whatever language is dominant in, in their community. So in Singapore, it would be English. So let me give you an example. When we write, therefore, when we write in English, we are thinking in English and we hear these things as we type them out, yeah? So in communication, now, nowadays you guys text a lot with friends, you text in communication, you will laugh sometimes and you go ha 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 ha, right? So we all know how do you laugh in text, you have to write ha 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 at least three times, right? At least three times, sometimes you go really long strings of ha, it's, okay, so you, you do that and it has to be at least ha 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 three times for it to constitute as a laugh, right, in the deaf community. There was once, I posted something online, Facebook, and a deaf friend responded with ha, H-A, just once. Now, to a hearing person, when you read that, that's not a laugh. When somebody types ha, he's trying to be funny, you disagree with me, you don't like what I said, right? So, before I decided to jump into the wrong conclusion and think, excuse me, I thought my post was quite smart, thank you, I texted another group of deaf friends, a close group that I, that I communicate with often, and I asked them a very simple question. Can I just find out when you see ha, 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 and when you see ha, the same? And they're like, yeah, it's the same. And I was like, how can it be the same? Why would you type ha if you wanted to say ha, ha, ha? If it was funny, why do you just type ha? And they're like, why do you want to waste characters when you type? For the deaf, it is visual, it means the same thing. You don't want to waste time doing too much, just like signing this morning, you don't want to waste time signing extra things if you could just complete it in a single action. So it's language efficiency, and they view the world differently, right? So it's all visual, and one ha is as good as three, okay? The other thing about sign languages that we need to know is that within the world of sign languages, there are different types of sign languages because different communities sign differently. So, as I mentioned before, you have the American Sign Language that's used by American Deaf, British Sign Language used by the British. The dominant culture uh, in these two countries, they speak English, but the sign systems are different. So again, they're not related, right? The Japanese use Japanese Sign Language. In Singapore, we use Singapore Sign Language. There can be mutual intelligibility, meaning there are some sign languages that look similar. So if you know one, you may be able to understand some part of another. So for example, Australian Sign Language looks very similar to British Sign Language. They are different enough for you to be able to tell that they're two different languages. But if you know Auslan, Australian Sign, it is very possible that if you went to Britain, and you met with deaf people there, you probably wouldn't have too much difficulty communicating with them. So in Singapore, Singapore Sign Language is what we use, what we say we use, and it is fairly mutually intelligible with American Sign. So most of us who use Singapore Sign Language can understand to some degree American Sign. It's not that exactly the same, but because of our language histories, we're able to understand some part of it. Okay. So, what is it then about this group of people who use sign language and why is it so important that when we think about sign language, we have to think about the people, the community that uses it as well? Now, we know already that sign language is used primarily by a community that we call deaf. But specifically, what I want to introduce to you today is this term deaf with a capital D. Okay, so it's not just deaf, people who can't hear, but deaf, people who have a distinct cultural identity. People like me. I speak of us, and I speak of we. 
some of you may think, uh, that's strange. You just said a while ago that you're hearing I am. I speak, yes. But I also sign. And in signing, in embracing the language of a community, over the last 20 years, I have also started to pick up certain understandings of their values, their belief systems, the way they orientate themselves. So in that regard, I consider myself deaf. But when we look at communities, of course, you don't just say, oh, simply because I sign, I am deaf, and yay, I'm, I'm one of you. No, it's a process that you go through. Um, when you become a part of a community, it's not just yourself saying that you're, you're part of them, but the community themselves must accept you as well. And before I came up here, I told all my deaf friends, I said, I'm going to talk about, you know, sign language and, and us, I suppose. Would you mind if I called myself deaf as well? And they're like, no, fine, you're just one of us. You're deaf, right? You're deaf. Why do the deaf think that way? Interestingly, not everyone who is deaf with a small d is deaf. So when we look at the deaf community, what exactly do we mean and who are we actually talking about? Some of you say, well, wait, I, I can't stand hearing you say the word deaf, deaf, deaf all the time. It doesn't sound like it's the right word to use. Shouldn't we be polite? Shouldn't we call them hearing impaired? No. To us, to the deaf community, the word hearing impaired is actually what is jarring. Now, why? Again, the deaf community is a community that does not orientate itself to sound. Hearing people orientate themselves to sound, right? So everything is hearing something. A deaf person would have hearing loss, or they are hearing impaired. It's a deficiency. The deaf, however, we don't think that there's anything wrong with our, what do you call? Hearing? What's that? And people like to say, you don't know what you're missing, you can't hear the music, you can't hear the like. But if I don't know, why would I miss it? So the deaf community does not see themselves as an impaired community. They don't see themselves as lacking in something. So what does it mean then for someone like me to be in this community where, well, I clearly have hearing, and I did not grow up deaf. Why am I here talking to you about them? They should be the ones talking to you about themselves. So I'm always careful when I come to sessions like these to let people know I am not deaf. And you hear me saying this very often, I am not deaf. I don't pretend to be. And well, I know I can never be like a deaf person because I know what hearing is like. And if I were really to lose my hearing today, I would miss it. But what I'm here to tell you then is that people like us, however, who cross boundaries between two cultures, what is our role? How do we understand our position as hearing people who embrace deaf cultures? And they're not just people like me. You have hearing children born to deaf pe parents. What about them? Where do we stand? Singapore signed the UN Convention of Rights uh, for Persons with Disabilities in 2013. Within the convention, there have been about, uh, there are about seven mentions of deafness and sign language. And clearly, this convention frames the deaf community as disabled. Now, I don't know who are the people who are involved in writing this up. But one of the things that has happened after the signing of the UNCRPD in Singapore is that it has begun to open up conversations between people like yourselves, people like myself, who clearly this convention is not for, but it opens up conversations for us to think about how we fit into this frame. What does it mean for us in Singapore to say that today we are ready to talk about human rights in the area of disability. When I entered the deaf community, the first thing that I did was actually to be an interpreter. And as a sign language interpreter, um, sometimes you think about yourself being there, knowing the language, so you can help the deaf. 
But over time, I've started to think about this. Am I really there to help them? Do they really need help? I asked my deaf friend recently, between being thought of as a disabled person, someone that I need to give concessions to, and thinking of yourself as like anybody else, except that I use a different language, which would you prefer? If, I, if you were to take the former, today in Singapore, because of the UN convention, uh, this convention, UNCRPD, you have people with disability cards. So you have PWD cards, and those get you concessions. You get into shorter queues, right? You get cheaper bus rides. You get quite a few things with this card today. So the UN convention, this one, has done quite a few things for the community. But I asked her, give all of that up, be recognized as someone who just uses a different language. Which would you prefer? She said, of, of course, the latter. I, I don't see myself as being disabled. I can do everything that you can. It's just a language thing. How do we understand, then, the people who use sign language? How do we understand them, even though this has given us a good framework to think about it? What are we doing in response? The UNCRPD talks about human rights, and what human rights really wants to achieve is this idea of equality. Where is the equality if you begin by talking about them as people who are impaired, as people who have less, as people who have a loss? So, really, when people like us, you and me, we say, oh, sign language is so fun, it's so cool, I, I, I want to learn this, it's, it's nice to use. Uh, what are we saying? Right? Do we recognize that there's this entire community behind this that's trying to fight, actually, for their survival as well? Now, in Singapore, the predominant view of deafness is what we call pathological view. We look at it from a medical perspective. In 2002, we started the universal newborn hearing screening test for all babies in Singapore. What this has meant for us is that the moment a baby is born, within the first three days, the baby is in the hospital. It gets tested for hearing. And if we detect hearing loss by doctors, the first person that they see is a medical personnel. And what have these people been telling parents? You have to get your child fixed. Don't use sign language. If you use sign language, your child will never learn to speak. For a new parent, that's really scary to think about. Since 2002, because of the UNHS in Singapore, the good thing is, yes, we are discovering deafness earlier, which means we can do something about it. But the question is, what is this something that we're doing? In the process of telling people things like that, if your child learns sign language, they will never learn how to speak. You need to get them fixed. You can go for surgery. In the process of us telling people things like that, we are actually saying certain things about sign language and, and about the people who use this language. Oh, it's the other option. Oh, this group of people who are using sign language is because they had no other choice. Oh, don't you feel bad for them? Oh, wow, you're a sign language interpreter. You help the deaf. What does all of that mean, right? What do the deaf themselves think? My language is not deficient. It's a full, complete language. It's complex. We can discuss abstract ideas. This entire talk can be carried out in sign language. It's not limiting at all. Years ago, when I first started out as an interpreter in Singapore, one of the first things uh, I did was to actually write my, my first forum article. And it was in response to a mother whose son had done very well at the O levels. And it was newsworthy because the boy was hearing impaired. But he had managed to get straight A's because his mother sent him for intense therapy. And so he could hear. And that's why he's successful. 
And in that article, the mom said, when I looked at sign language and I picked up a dictionary, it said 4,000 signs. And I thought, how can I bring my child up in a language that has only 4,000 words? 4,000 signs is not 4,000 words, it's just signs. The dictionary was thick because in sign language dictionaries, everything's done in a picture format. You have sign language dictionaries that go into the thousands of pages because they're huge. They're like, you know, telephone books. Today, of course, with technology, you put them in an iPhone and it's all in there. But, you know, these things limit what people think sign language looks like because they pick up a book and they go, wow, so thick and only 4,000 words. How could I bring up a child in this environment? But that's not what the language is. These dictionaries don't represent accurately what the language is and who the people are who use this language what hearing people say about sign language and about the people who use sign language has a huge impact. And we need to, to think carefully about this. So really, before I go, sign language is interesting, it's beautiful, I love it. Um, I love being deaf and part of the community, but really, when you learn a language, think about the people that come with this language and what it is that hearing people are saying, are doing, can say and can do to affect this entire community, which is otherwise very marginalized in our society. Thank you.